Hey everyone, uh, my name is Emma Welch. This is a video series where um, Art Plus Public Team is uh, bringing you a behind the scenes look at Canadian artists' practices. So for this iteration, we're particularly interested in speaking with artists that have um, more collaborative practices as well as duos. Um, and today I have the privilege and pleasure of being joined by Sarah Jane Gorlitz as well as uh, Wojtek Olenik. Uh, of Soft Turns to chat about their shared practice. So before we begin here, um, I just wanted to provide you a brief uh, introduction to Soft Turns. So Soft Turns uh, collaborations engage with natural and human made systems and seek to establish relationships with non-human subjects that appear as compelling as opaque. Uh, for example, thermodynamic systems, soil, computer circuitry and life experiences of plants. Alongside simple mechanisms like gears, pulleys, optic fibers, and um, crucially their, their own bodies. Soft turns uses stop motion animations, capacity to stretch and collapse time to attempt to follow the rhythms of their subjects. Research, conversation, but also their senses, touching, seeing, listening, guide them through uh, the mechanisms and movements in their shared environment, resulting in slow paced, immersive, embodied video centered installations. Um, yeah, so uh, to maybe to start, can you two tell us a little bit about yourselves and your shared practice? Okay, thank you for the very nice introduction. Thank you very much. And for hosting us here. It's always yeah. nice to have an invitation to talk about our work because in the end, that's kind of why we're making the work that we make. Um, sure. We've been working together for a while, since 2006. 2006. Um, when we also you know, started a relationship. We're married. We have kids as well now. So it's been a while, but from the beginning, we started, I mean, we both, uh, we met in art school and uh, we were both painters at the time. Um, and we wanted to collaborate with each other, um, but sort of in a space that we weren't either sort of too knowledgeable or too opinionated about. So yeah. We started with making, um, I was making paintings of dioramas and Wojtek was make, doing a lot of work on AutoCAD and architectural buildings and stuff uh, like that. renderings and things. And so we, it seemed sort of natural for us to do something about public space, actually, because it was a very um, interesting topic at the time. Um, and that we would just we decided to build a subway space. This is kind of like the very earliest piece that we worked on collaboratively um, and explore the space as a uh, as a way to, as a kind of a metaphor for some of our interests at the time, which was sort of like the self and other and this environment that we humans create for ourselves. Um, and we, we also based the model on found materials and objects. For instance, we use like chiclets uh, to create walls of uh, tiles for in the subway, mm -hmm. or what was it, a Venetian blinds, for instance, for a ceiling of another model, <clears throat> and that was a way just to um, engage with the real world, even though we're still working in models. And this was ended up being a, a stop motion animation. And as soon as we started working in that medium, we realized the potential for a very kind of particular expression of reality where um, with time-lapse photography or stop motion, you're essentially taking things that come out of a real space, inputting your own ideas and interests and manipulating them sometimes, even making your own moves with your own bodies within the space and slowing down time, speeding it up and creating something new. And that process, that sort of extended contemplative engagement with the materials and with time and space goes runs through all of our work since then. And in general, just um, again, going back to materials, uh, we found that uh, we wanted to work with something real that has <clears throat> that uh, reacts with, uh, with the real world, like with real forces and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that became very important um, as soon as we started. And the second video, and I will—I think we will not go through all the videos one by one, but just to give you an idea, we use the same model that we used for the subway system, but this time we wanted to do, do something that is kind of outside of our control. <clears throat> and we wanted to, again, allow the real world sort of enter more so and uh, our authorship to sort of, you know, be 
uh, kind of Push less back important. Back. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we created this big tub and we started fill filling it with one glass of water. And I would take a picture, a glass of water, take a picture. And then we would take out a glass of water once it's submerged and take a picture. So basically it looked like the models were, or the subway system was flooding. And as soon as it started, like the water started entering the space and like this molasses or something, uh, we realized like, wow, this is so different than what we expected. Mm -hmm. And then uh, immediately after that, uh, in the next scene actually, uh, when the water started entering and the rails that were just barely attached to the bottom started floating, we kind of started thinking, okay, well, this is one of those moments where like you either go with it or, you know, scrap this whole thing and start over. And we went with it and it feels like the kind of decision that sort of marked our career since then, where it became very important to, again, allow for things to happen, allow the materials yeah. to function the way they want to sort of, mm -hmm. and, if we're going to collaborate, because we're collaborating really with each other, we also want to collaborate outside of us as well. Mm -hmm. So you need to do and that. And that navigation too. between the space, not only between us. It's interesting that you both had like a painting practice or like a practice that is so different than how, how you approach making now. Um, I also love that, yeah, like kind of space, public spaces kind of brought you to where you are now a little bit. But um, I'm curious, I picked up something, Wojtek, that you said uh, that what was that year that you created that work that sort of became like a pivotal moment where you were like, oh, this is how we, you know, you're being flexible to other, what more project was that? The water? 2007, 2007, okay. 2007 just, okay. just like water that's called. Okay. And yeah, it was the one of the subway system. Like yeah. okay. created subway system, created one work, and then we used it for something completely different. Right. And and that's sort of, just to that add continues. to that. Yeah, because yeah. after that, that, like, again, we work on models, takes a long time to do that. We sure. have some idea, we're having conversations about, hey, let's do this and this. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Okay, fine. Now we're in the process of actually making it. And because we're quite detailed oriented and there's two of us, and I think we have a lot of ideas, it always becomes like this really laborious, long <laughs> process. Yeah. And so two months later, like, so we're doing that with it? I'm like do, what? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I guess that is such 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 a great idea. An example of like sure. through through the window. So another right. early work. Again, this is like way too early maybe to be talking about. But two thousand nine. No. Um. So this was a. We somehow were talking about. We were reading like Merleau Ponty and and talking about phenomenology and the experience of the world. And we had this moment where like, what if we had? What if you saw? Oh, and we're this is also um, Borges because we we're yeah. that's too much. Whatever. But we, I had this idea. It's like, what if you're like doing dishes at the, at the sink and just out of the corner of your eye, you think you see the shadow of a bird that seems to be moving its wings. At, in tandem with the way that the window so like the window I think there was a fluttery window or something mm -hmm. and it was like that shouldn't be possible and it's but kind it of magical happen. and yet that moment where you're not really it's, directly it's thinking like you're not oh, I'm reading or I'm working on a puzzle or I'm 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 in control right mm -hmm. that kind of inattentive sort of involuntary attention space like, what if that could be real? And so we started to make a video, which was like about that. And so we were like, okay, so we should do a stop motion and we'll need to take a, f like a Photoshop, we'll take a video of a bird moving naturally and then make silhouettes as a stop frame around its wings so that we can then transfer that into just a silhouette. Mm -hmm. So we had all these really intricate labor sort of of this wing and moving and everything. Mm -hmm. And then we projected that also. with the projector onto a window that we found in the trash. Um, and no, we didn't. We bought that window. Did we buy it? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was, it was a and the salvage. Anyways, yeah. the point was that we had that, and then it was like, okay, so we'll take pictures as a stop motion, and and we'll move the window as the bird as we advance frame by frame the movement of the bird. Can I just add something. Yeah. So um, I'm probably gonna say what you're gonna say, anyways. But I created this diagram, a very complex diagram of when the Bird is like really shift, so just a little bit. So, yeah. and Sarah Jane was going to be the window uh, open it's like all these operator. vectors. Yeah, they're not vectors. They're just, <laughs> they're just points. You're like, okay, this is like goes really up, so you got to really open it. And here, just a little bit, so you just open it a little bit. And then she would be sitting there um, doing this, 
and we'd be taking stop motion videos and we do this over and over again. Another element of our work mm -hmm. is it seems like our work is this kind of rehearsals. We just do it yeah. over and over and over again. Because with stop motion, you don't know really what you're going to get until you get it. And the first time you do it, when you're just experimenting, it looks amazing. And then you're kind of like, how do I get that again? And again, right. that, that's sort of right. yeah. what we're dealing with all the time. But just to get back to what I was saying, or what you were saying, <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. If you want to... No, it's okay. But I just like, at a certain point, I learned the movements and the rhythms yeah. in my face somehow. And she threw my I papers just, at I didn't need it, I... it at all. And... Like you need the papers. How are you going to remember how to do that? But I did. I found like it's that's, and I think that's she, she why. Sounded like like playing a song, like you know, like a trombone or something like that, and it became a lot more natural the way the window would open and close. And so I think that's why that's kind of a nice little anecdote from an earlier work, where we've continued in every work. We try to be aware of our bodies even as we're moving yeah. around the space. We're trying to be attuned to the rhythms of this of the things that we're working with and in the space that we're in and of course you can never say oh i'm just you know obviously we set up these little kind of experiments to then flourish and provide us with something that we can then use we're obviously using work so i mean there's all these con conflicting problems in that um but i think the gesture that we're aiming for is getting at some kind of authentic moment that then we can share and we're not going to like tell you what it's necessarily all about. We're not going to put a voice over on it. We're not going to have figures tell you certain aspects of the story that pertain to some kind of grander truth because it's about the viewer having that moment too and being oh. able to also sort of step into the space. We also and slow. I suspect, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, I also suspect that like because of the nature of the making and being flexible to materials and being flexible to see yeah. what happens as an experiment that you you know, instead of having this fixed narrative, it doesn't really make sense. Like you always have to kind of be flexible, I guess. Yeah, yeah you two are very flexible people <laughs> in, in your making. That's, I don't know yeah. if we are uh, really. And not but, uh, are, yeah. maybe, but definitely forces us to be like that. Uh, yeah. One one thing to add to all that is also that, like for instance, the video that Sergey is describing through the window, it's only one minute and 21 seconds long. And I remember that because it's so short. And a lot of our, especially early stop motions, were that short. And they're always on a seamless loop. So the idea was that the viewer comes in whenever they they can start watching it whenever. So again, it's like a very short moment, you know, one minute of, of something. So we want to really slow things down and just kind of, again, w repeat it and look at it from different points of view or just allow the viewer to stay there as long as they want, uh, leave whenever they want. That kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What um being kind of flexible and you know uh, building sort of more experiment based scenarios and stop motion and working with technology like what what does a a day in the studio look like for you too like how do you begin to produce a work um does it start with a concept usually is it does it stem from other kind of works that you've produced that ended up informing another work um yeah oh. how do those ideas form and start. Well, we, we have, we've, for years now, we've been having meetings. Right. <laughs> That's sort of like That's our, uh, yeah. because I mean, when you're, uh, you know, we, I was do, we doing my master's in Sweden. I was yeah. working on paintings at the time. Um, yeah. And Patrick came with me. And so we were just trying to manage your time really. to continue the collaboration with me be, being very occupied. Mm -hmm. And so we would, you know, he would stay at home or go to the park and, I, I was trying to, reading. I was doing a lot of writing, actually. A that's lot how. of reading and a lot of writing. So I um, do want to say that I was busy. <laughs> that's really become a very important part of our work and our working practice. Just having conversations, keeping notes, lots of notebooks full of our conversations and our ideas. But also a lot of walking and talking. Walking and I mean, talking, yes. going to the beach with our readings and reading there. Sort of going back to really early uh, on, like, um, we moved to Berlin 2007 without knowing anyone there. And it took us about, I don't know, I don't know three, four months before we really, we met some Canadians and we met all the Canadians. It was kind of like that. And, and so, I mean, the, th the reading is, is important. Um, also, we would like read different books and then take notes. This is something we're doing a lot of right now in the context of our residency at Gallery 44. We're, and we're producing, like we're doing a, a reading group there because we were like, oh, now we can ex join more people into this conversation that we're having. But uh, like, well, 
to be like underlining things and then we'll be, present to each other what we found interesting at this point and um and and so that's um that's a very crucial thing and the residency at the university so we were in a res three-year residency at the university of guelph um in the school of environmental sciences um as artists in resident there and uh we participated in some like discussion groups also with students who were in those fields and so we just but naturally would also because of the work that we were doing with plants um, and their collaborations with NASA and all this controlled environment stuff that um, we started to become fascinated by. Uh, we we were reading a lot of different kinds of stuff so, there. So. so just to answer your question a little bit more fully, maybe or simply, uh, our day could be sort of anything, but and we do usually start with a concept. And as we like mentioned before, conversation. yeah, but, but as we were saying before, like a lot of time it morphs quite yeah. a lot by the time we get to the end of it. And so, yeah, it, it, the, the conversation is kind of always there. And there, then there's also, I think, really important to mention the, again, the laborious sort of element of our work. A lot of time we make models, we make things. And, and that takes a lot of time. And again, it's, it's a lot of our work is not just sort of conceptually driven, but also the tactile yeah. through sensation, you know, like actually uh, work with something. For and, instance, sorry, uh, that reach yeah. is a good example of something where this yeah. was had this idea about, we've been researching plants um, being grown by astronauts and we'd read a a book of like a journal diary from a Soviet astronaut who had done this. This is for a show in 811. Um, and we were, were fascinated by that and all of the work that was being uh, done, like research based work on plants, how they survive in gravity. How would they, how would we get, um, a colony in Mars? All this kind of interesting, really weird stuff. And so we were like, well, we should grow, um, a plant and imagine in you know in some kind of future thought ex a thought experiment of a future cohabitation of a plant and uh in space that went that, wrong. that went wrong and there's some computer chips <laughs> because we're also reading that you know um our previous work e-material had been about e-waste and how there's all these precious materials and also toxic materials on circuit boards we're like and also we talk talking to, this, to her, uh, sorry talking to the researcher in uh, the university who's like, oh, but you know, you can use certain kinds of rocks to get nutrients for plants that people aren't using right now. And there's this whole crazy wasted, wasteful, I you know, know fertilizer I, I industry. And, and so like, he's doing like, well, you can use these kinds of local rocks and grind them down. And, and then the minerals get used this way. And they're like, oh, could you grind down circuit boards and get plants to eat off of that? And he's like, I don't know. And then we're like, well, let's find out. And then, and then we were like, but, but plants, when their roots are growing, you know, they don't, you can't, um, we have all this images of like these flat plants growing, you know, constrained between two panes of glass and they're like fixed in this very, you know, rational science, Western science, you know, this is the real truth and how this works. And then we're like, but what if we have the plants, the roots growing in the round and you could see all of the little roots growing in all space and it's turning. And then we're like, okay, so we have to learn how to make a gear system that would turn a plant in a basin of water super 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 slowly to get a time lapse of the roots growing and then but we need to turn on the we light, have to light, light, light. It only for the photograph because the roots won't grow if like even the fact that it was here in our space like we'd be over this time we had this really involved relationship because the shoot took like two months or something yeah. and, and 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 there are some like nice moments i'd be like uh walking with our earliest with our earliest with our youngest daughter aspen up on the stairs, you know, trying to get her to fall asleep, like she would wake up in the middle of the night, whatever. And then I would see downstairs, the light turn on. And I'm like, yeah. Nice. Yeah, you're like kind of monitoring it, but while you're taking- If he's okay, that he's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of this, obviously, it's kind of interesting as a story behind the scenes. Um, but I think with all of our work, the goal is that the video speaks somehow for itself and allows enough entry points for people to be like, whoa, this is weird. What's happening? I, I've never, or I don't know if I've recognized this in some yeah, way. And like exactly code. yeah. Our, our installation called Fluorescence is also something that came out of a weird intersection of a moments of technology in the sense of like light reflected off of uh, printed ink, but also light from a laptop. Um, where I was carrying a laptop towards an image on a wall and the light from the screen was, uh, 
was the only illumination in the work. In fact, it came from an idea, and this is maybe good to show you like where the idea is. Like we read somewhere that um, it is possible. There's this one kind of moss, and since then we've read gathering moss, and we know which kind of moss is. And I forget the name of it right now, but it will actually grow with the light of a laptop screen. And so yeah, that connection thought. was like, wow, that's amazing. The laptop screen can actually provide. And so we then started researching photosynthesis and all these things. Yeah. But the installation is one where you're moving through a space. There's a bunch of monitors facing different directions. They're all kind of these sort of searching videos of, um, of biology textbooks, which have been published. Uh, this one biology of plants have been published for the past uh, 50 years, I think. In, in the 70s. Yeah. So like, there's like eight or nine editions. We had all of them and we would trace the images as they progressed through the different edit editions. And sometimes there'd be an arrow inserted into the image or a circle or like, so it was like, it would be cropped differently. Like a history of like, how do we want to present information as a scientist and starting and you imagine like, you know, a 70s burlap version or like, you know, there's all these these ways that information is packaged for you. And but so also the way the uh, light reflects on all the different editions or different copies that we had would be very yeah. different. So as you're kind of flipping through the different um, images that are actually the same image, uh, yeah, you see all these kind of differences. Um, Anyways, yeah, so... Um, I don't know what were you going to say. No, no, that's. I was. I think I was just bringing that installation as as an example of one of those things which started from a weird an idea idea. comes to be, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then became also also about the physical stuff as well. And also looking at these images that we found, and again, this we have this kind of non-expert approach to things. Like Mm -hmm. we want to know more as much as possible, but we know sort of. We haven't, you know, we don't have a PhD on this or anything like that, yeah. but we still want to know and want to know maybe in a different way. Maybe, mm-hmm. again, if you slow something down or you know, take it apart or uh, shine light even on the image of it, maybe we can find something else that could be uh, co-opted into uh, knowledge about that thing in general. I mean, it's interesting right now in the days that we live, it seems like from so many different angles, um, the idea that we know things is like being attacked. Like we really don't, the more that we know, the actually the, the more we know we don't know, um, mm-hmm. like the whole world of the microbiome is just opened up so much fascinating research. And it's really just the past like 40 years or so, which is super fresh. Um, and so, you know, the idea of being able to present uh, this kind of lineage of rational thought through history is just, it doesn't even really, it's not that interesting anymore. Like it's so much more interesting to think about, you know, the fact that your laptop, when you send an email, you know, it's producing heat and mm-hmm. that heat, you know, is actually information on the level of bits, um, ones and zeros in a logic gate that says, ah, I need to go somewhere. This information needs to dissipate. It becomes heat. And then you touch your laptop and it's warm. Like, how does that, that actually is a, it's part of the it's reason why it's part, part of the reason, but like I think so we've really sort of forgotten so much about the reality of what our intimate space is. We just take it for granted and we're like, there's a screen, it's flat. That's it. Well, it's so, like you know, like when you know the air quality has been so poor from all the fires that we take for granted the same that it's like air is shared, or you know, like you take for granted what is around you because you kind of exist in it and it becomes you know, habitual every day, like, you know, everything you see. Um, so yeah, exactly. it's nice to be able to stop and pause. And then, you know, I feel like for your practice, it seems that, you know, you're very interested in dissecting those things and like pulling them apart and what happens and how did this start from this? And um, just one little note about the air yeah. quality related to those fires. So we've been doing this reading group at Gallery 44. Right. And the very first one was going to happen on the, like right when that really peaked in the early days. What, what month was that? Uh, that was in late June. June yeah. yeah. June, July. And we had this moment where we were like, oh, should we kind of cancel it or have it inside? Like there was all these thoughts. And then we're like, but our reading is all about plants and how they experience the world and they can't go yeah. anywhere. So it was kind <laughs> of this weird like, okay, let's go to a park and sit down and read about plants and how they're, you know, they're, they're sentient in some way, maybe, um, and yet fixed. And how traditionally you think of plants as being, you know, really not that important in the whole world. And yet they are in sense, 
the only reason why we have a world. They produce oxygen. They take energy from the sun yeah. and create yeah. and create life. And and yet they can't move. So we think, oh, so they don't they can't move. So they must be really, you know, um, very basic in terms because we can move and we have all these organs that we know about and everything. I'm like, well, what about being able to taste different chemicals and understand what that is? So, anyways. That's uh, it was really interesting to make that moment where we're like, our bodies are going into the smoke and that's okay. And that's, that makes us aware more of where we are as humans on this planet. For sure. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to know more about sort of your material interests, um, especially like working with plants, um, but also like lenses and uh you know building materials and and optic fibers and um yeah i feel like there's there's few that are kind of consistent and integral to sort of the work you produce do you want to maybe talk about how those materials relate to both kind of like physical objects that you make and also um and like how they exist digitally and kind of like the relationship between working between both of those things with these materials sure um, you know, well, uh, no, I can start. We've always worked with things like paper or wood just because, again, we would make a lot of models. So that was <clears throat> easy uh, material to use just for the basic sort of uh, structures of things. But we've, we've also, sorry, I just thought about that. We've also made videos where there's just whatever garbage we can found on the streets of where we're living. We've been living in different places and I mean, we've always had a sustainable kind of interest, um, but I think also just our interest in familiar objects, things that people would also be familiar with as well, always colored some of the work that we were uh, building. We also uh, did a whole video where we created a library out of books, yeah. uh, found books, and then one of the books that we found, we actually realized that the images in it had a really interest. We, we became really interested just in the images and then we started on a whole project from that. So and that just, was like an in, image kind of related thing, but yeah. also another work that we did on um, Stone Cell was we were, had all these books and we noticed there were these little bright spots, like if you held up a cheap paperback into the light, you might find a little kind of a spot, a glitch in it. And then we discovered that that was actually a result of a paper making um, process where um, certain kinds of stone cells, they're called stone cells, they don't break down properly when they are processed into cheap paper. And so they become like these tiny little, almost like optic fibers is what we started calling them. Well, we found an article about that yeah. uh, by this Greek uh, biologist um, that basically claims that when you have a tissue of a plant, let's say, and you want the light to get down into the cells that are not just on the surface. Not just on the surface of the leaves. Of the leaf. the yeah, exactly. Um, these cells, these stone cells. Which might, are dead cells also. Yeah, also that's important to mention. Act almost like this kind of medium to send the light, like crystallines basically, to send the light down into tissue for like other cells to yeah. actually take advantage of the light. And, and so then we thought, well this is awesome and it's so much like optic fibers and we're like well let's find more of these so we went through our all of our books <laughs> one by one trying oh, to find and we went to dollar stores to try to find paper and we had like a huge collection finally of these little tiny stone cells and we made a video of them moving in a kind of a circle like a celestial kind of path um uh, but yeah so there's a sort of history of how often uh, our work kind of starts with one thing and then turns into something else and continues. And eventually we're like, well, why don't we just try to just deal with digital on our own? So like in Photoshop, one day we're just doing all kinds of weird things like, hey, what if we take this little red, I don't know, square and just make the image smaller and bigger or something like that. Yeah. And we started finding all these weird patterns started happening. And we're like, that's like, uh, entropy or something. That's like, like we're adding information into uh, this because thing. Because when you save the files, well, I was about to say. So, so let's say the original file file is like one megabyte, and then you do this resizing thing. So you were resizing it like ninety nine point nine nine percent percent down, and then so just back. a teeny tiny bit down, and then a tiny bit up. Back to one hundred, and, and then, nothing would happen initially. But if you did it like five hundred or a thousand or. A, for 2,000 times, all of a sudden these weird 
strange, growthy, like pixelated forms would start happening on the image. And the more you do it, the more it forms. But it also seems to be like this weird limit. But also, depending on the different percentages you use, and and even if you just resave it, I've noticed that would happen too. And I just started becoming become fascinated by this uh, function that basically does nothing but you know returns things to the way it was but actually doesn't and and again it's kind of like entropy like the you just keep adding information into the the universe so yeah so I, all i was saying is like the let's say original file was like one megabyte you know after a thousand iterations would be like five megabytes and and it will just continue to grow and we did like a whole video where we use this process and again we have a lot of experience by now with images and keeping yeah. them on hard drive or whatever because of stop motion, we have a lot of images and a lot of information. But like we we're kind of like freaked out, like how come this stop motion animation, like all the images like or the sizes of them are way bigger than it's supposed to be. And then start realizing that because of this glitch, the images actually got bigger and bigger. And and then this kind of morphed into an exhibition we had at 811, which was about also about molds um, as this kind of weird productive force that grows in these weird ways. So we called it a digital mold and we sort of used the gallery walls and we photographed them and then produced this kind of digital weird deterioration and then we put those images back on the walls as well as images from plants um, this arabidopsis plant that we've worked with but i think we should also mention that the arabidopsis was a plant that we were introduced to when we were doing residency in guelph and realized yeah. that all the scientists were using them it's just like a little weed oh, uh, tiny, oh yeah i'll go get uh, one a tiny little weed that, that can kind of grow in cracks of sidewalks yeah. and whatever and that they use, the scientists use them kind of like the lab rats uh, in biology for all kinds of experiments. Right. They have a very short life cycle and, and their genome has been sequenced. So so basically, you know, that's an Arab You have science. all the information you need about this plant before you start experimenting with it. Yeah. And, and it was the first one to flower and go through a uh, uh, life cycle, life cycle space. in space because a Soviet astronaut was trying to grow things to eat but and he was like, to, this and salad and nothing else is growing. But just to connect it to sort of this digital sort of, uh, of mold idea or whatever glitch, it, we, we started thinking about like how you can do all these experiments on Arabidopsis or on anything. And it seems like through observation and repetition, you will, you know, kind of verify the data. And, fully know something. And fully know something yeah. as well. Um, this is, and 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 then yet here we are messing around this Photoshop, uh, you know, sort of situation, and just saving the file over and over again, like adding stuff to it, yeah. and like yeah, that's that's how the world really is, isn't it? It's not not like you just confirm more and more what you already know. Yeah. You always yeah. add more information, and we found that like how sort of nice it is this this if if we did uh, this project with an image of Arabidopsis, it's kind of like. Everybody has the last laugh a little bit. Like, uh, no, you don't know fully. I'm turning into this digital mode, haha, you know, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also used, sorry? sorry, you also used this plant, um, the project that you recently did at Assembly Park, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exploring the same kind of concept, digital mold. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. We, we had a GIF. We made a GIF of, of the hey, yeah. growing mold. And uh, yeah, I actually started thinking at some point, like, what if we just didn't, you know, like a million iterations of it? So we just kept making yeah. it longer and longer. Uh, but for, for Assembly Park, we just took one of the stills when the digital mode is really sort of uh, dominant and uh, painted the mu mural of it on the. Uh, yeah, that was sort of half of the project. The other part was um, yes. kind of trying to share a bit of the story about this Arabidopsis taliana. It's it's known as maybe Thale crest to some people, but it's really just this weed that you can find around you everywhere find in the it. world. We, we searched we for it for it's just months. So small, as you saw, like every every, of... every book that, that we read, like oh yeah, you know, walk on the sidewalk, you'll find it. You didn't find it on the sidewalk. Anything. Really. Oh. Like there's this this thing that everyone uses, and apparently it's everywhere. But it's, it's actually... just another one of these stories. But yeah. anyways, um, yeah. what's uh? So we were like, well, this this plant, you know, used to grow in sort of this kind of disturbed habitats, like near humans, but sidewalks, that kind of thing. And we're like, well, why don't we produce a seed packet and actually share it with anybody who comes to this okay. garden? Yeah. The setting was a uh, um, a public art garden, and like this yeah. would be. Great 
because then people could take their Avidopsis home and grow their own. Yeah, so we oh, have great. a packet. And mm -hmm. then there's some like information about what the Arabidopsis is, sort of like its history being used as this guinea pig for um, plant research and its adventure in space. And then there's a, a QR code that links to the uh, the GIF online. Well, right. Anyway, it's that uh, we're also growing, like I showed you on this break, we're growing more of them for a project we're doing for Nuit Blanche. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Yes. So, I mean, all of this stuff that we've been kind of talking yeah, about, uh, we, I mean, you can kind of see some of the threads in our thinking and like this research and talking about um, the ways that humans kind of think and organize the world or, or perceive order in the world in a way. Um, and we're kind of always just interested in like, that doesn't necessarily always work or there's cracks in that, or we perceive it with our own totally different biases. And we make a lot of assumptions and have bad habits. And so we're interested in, yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, just how this project started. I guess I was going to. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. Uh, well, we were reading uh, actually for our research for Gallery 44 and a potential uh, reading group article uh, by Matteo Pasquinelli called Rituals, the Emergence of AI from the Computations of Space. Anyway, so we read this this article where he talks about um, kind of the origin of algorithms, and he kind of starts it off very quickly, giving this example of this ancient culture where they had, I, I don't remember the details, but let's say like 70 stones, uh, and during uh, every time they would do the ritual, they would set these stones in a certain pattern. And as the more they did this, the more sort of formalized the pattern became. And by the sort of by the end, or not by the end, but some point, it, it kind of uh, took the the look of what an algorithm uh, kind of is. An algorithm, which is basically a set of instructions to create to do something like a recipe uh, to cook, would be. Uh, you could consider that a loose form of an algorithm. But his point was more like, look, this the idea of algorithm doesn't come necessarily from the Greeks, like where you think of, you know, the Greeks sort of uh, formalized it. And then from that point, uh, you know, we have the idea of algorithms. It was actually part of a long history of people moving around, uh, mm -hmm. doing things, then they would... Uh, follow the same paths or something like that, reinforce things, like almost like, like ants do, you know, when they're forage for, for food or something. Um, and the materials that they're actually dealing with, the spaces that you occupy uh, in a very loose form can kind of, through reinforcement, uh, you know, become like the, these set of instructions or kind of a, a loose form of an algorithm. And so we start to think like, wouldn't it be nice to create something that, instead of like using the, the sort of idea of algorithm as a really sort of uh, formal and precise thing, like we would think of sort of instructions for, a, I don't know, a computer program or something like that, we think about algorithms a lot more as this, an ancient practice that actually- Material. Or material practice. Material. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a better way of putting it. I mean, that's it. the thing. You think of algorithms, you think of AI, you think of the sort of domineering top-down yeah, rational, exactly. you know, progression of order and thought that comes to the right answer in the end. And so much more of our world these days is being kind of guided and, and built on that kind of structure. But there's like, like, what about bees? What about ants? What about... Plants. You know, the plants that are growing in a certain way, the roots as they grow, you know, and search out for their own, like, nutrients. Or it's impossible to watch that video reach without just following their paths and trying to imagine what they're looking for. And, like, it just feels like those kinds of intelligences also exist. They also have validity, and we should be paying attention more to that. So, so originally, we were thinking of uh, using uh, beach stones, like, right on the beach. Yeah. And creating kind of loose patterns. Like it was meant to be in a, a sort of a audience participation. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And then we would maybe leave instructions. At this point, we're still kind of in early stages of designing this this project, mm -hmm. but the audience would come in and they would be able to move things around and uh, create because together in a kind do. of a... Uh, because because like it's, because you know you go to any beach and it's almost an irresistible urge to like pick up a stone and move it somewhere or make a pattern or throw it into the water and we go all the time and people have built these little things or towers a lot of towers but like it's a very weird sort well, of in our nature to have like human intervention into you know the natural world or you know like 
And yeah. even beyond that, like thinking about what a beach is in terms of like, why are, why do people go there all the time? It's not just for like, obviously, yeah, it's fun. And we go to beaches for swimming and sunbathing, whatever. But there's some kind of human relationship to the edge of the water. Oh, yeah. yeah, That is an attraction. And it's really hardwired deep in our body. It's like we read some other paper about um, a psychologist always uh, trying to explain this concept of involuntary attention, which mm -hmm. is like when you're gardening or when you're outside in space and you're not focused on or one particular dishes. thing or taking dishes, but like something in your environment, you are just the right amount of attentiveness for your environment for if something changes, you're, you're, you're on it, but you're open to that. And we thought like, this is the best and it's really healthy for your brain, apparently. Um, so we're like, well, there's some reason why it's good for you to be in these spaces and to be exposed to that kind of thinking. So that was all kind but of also, put into this. Kind of a way of um, not thinking in a super kind of rational, you know, step by step kind of practical way of, of thinking and dealing with the world. And again, like when we thought about people participating, it would be like a lot of minds kind of working mm -hmm. together or not even working together, just doing stuff. And that this would be a kind of a product of this decentralized intelligence, something that we really became interested uh, recently of, yes. Well, I was just gonna say like James Bridal, somebody we've been reading a lot of lately, he's an artist and writer, and he makes a point. What was it that like, it, it, it's this sort of this theory now where it's like, uh, about experts. It? Experts. No, no right. it's not about it. I don't it's called well he called it cognitive diversity. He also called it diversity how diversity trumps ability. Like this idea that if you um have like in a corporation, you have get the best person for the job and you get them to figure out, I don't know, how to, you know solve a uh, problem. Solve a problem of some sort. But there's been study after study that shows that it's actually that this kind of a approach is not as effective as if you just got a bunch of non-experts. Now, people that still obviously understand something about this, but like them working as a team. The so more minds. The more minds, the more diversity you have of thinking, the more ability you actually have to solve something. Yeah. And it does make sense, like kind of in general, like when you think about, uh, you know, once the Greeks, going back to Greeks, uh, once you introduce democracy, all of a sudden, they, they have all these brilliant people have all these ideas and, and scientific kind of revolutions that, that happen from that. And it does feel like, well, is, is that not kind of because a lot more people got more involved or you think about, you know, the birth of, um, uh, not writing, but uh, printing, right? Like once uh, the printing process has became uh, prevalent and, and we should talk a little yeah. less about the western history sure, i mean that's sure. what we know more but of course what i said earlier about like so many different but just the idea of a lot of minds working together and this might is something be that has been recognized one... for ages in indigenous cultures in different you know like non-western like eastern traditions of course as well so anyways i just wanted to put that in there because you yeah. referenced the ancient greeks twice <laughs> yeah i know but once in a negative fashion so, so. okay anyways you, you balanced it out it's fine yeah uh, one one yeah <laughs> um besides uh nuit blanche uh what what else is on the horizon for you two or is there anything else that you're currently working on or well so we're artist in residence at gallery 44 currently and we'll be also next year um, okay. And we're uh, and we're working towards the show also there. Moshe um, also mentioned that uh, simultaneously, uh, uh, Gallery Forty Four also has a writer in residence, and her name is Wei Yi Chang. Mm -hmm. And their idea was sort of to start the residencies at the same time, and for us to again loosely collaborate or have more sort of I don't know co something have like, like a kind of a feedback <clears throat> yeah going yeah. on and, 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 so and that, we've opened that also with the reading group because we're right. i mean the the idea of that is like we propose some things but then people bring in their own thoughts we've got a active google doc um right now with everybody's comments and other things that people might be interested in reading and that's going to continue throughout the year um sporadically as well yeah. we try to do it like once a month but it mm -hmm. it's also you know what it is yeah yeah that's great. That's that's wonderful. Um, I just have one more question for you two, um, uh, which is something I, I like to ask a lot of artists. But what do you think is the um, 
the most important thing that an artist should remember to do as an artist? We'll say it again. What uh, is the most important thing for an artist important? to remember to do? Oh, to yeah. remember to do. Um, stay open-minded about, take lots of stuff in. Mm -hmm. uh, pay attention to what other people are thinking and doing around you, not just your group, but as many different discourses as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, and try not to build habits and thinking. And it's one of the most, especially as you age, it's really hard to not feel like you've understood something and you can use that for something else now. Like, yeah. and it's impossible not to, you know, but I it's already made like, thing to start a yeah. start work or something. Or to try to keep, keep engaging actively and, uh, and, and trust that somewhere out there, there's somebody who's just as interested in what you're thinking about as you are. And hopefully yeah. they'll see your work and maybe leave a comment and then you can, I don't know have a conversation yeah. Yeah. same same here okay. <laughs> i was gonna add some of that but yeah yeah i think that's well said yeah um well thanks so much both of you for your time today uh really appreciate it um and we'll be sure to link any and all of the things that we discussed today yeah. thank you so that's much awesome. it was great to have this opportunity to open things up with you yeah. keep us Question. informed about the readings as well Oh, oh, absolutely. Sure. We can sure. include a link to, uh, yeah. we'd like to have um, more people. Yeah, more peace, more discourse, you know, like everybody has their own world. And when they come together and can be shared through art, I think it's a really productive thing. I agree. Thanks. Like what you're doing. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.